Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're up to 100, I think, now. So uh, I'll start introductions. Uh, and more people will join. It's just the way the uh, webinar works. Um, good morning, and thank you very much indeed for joining us for this retail restructuring webinar um, presented by Radcliffe Chambers with uh, our very grateful assistance from Grant Thornton. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers, first of all. Um, I'm delighted that uh, Oliver, Ollie Haunch is here with us. Uh, he's a partner at Grant Thornton in London. Um, he has been part of their restructuring team since 2004, more than 17 years experience in advising lenders, senior management teams and other stakeholders in financially distressed situations. Uh, he leads the real estate offering and restructuring and has significant exposure to shopping centres, commercial office space, hotel and student accommodation. Ollie, nice to see you and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, hey David, thank you. Our other speaker this morning is Tina Kiriakides, who's a member at Radcliffe Chambers. Um, she'll be familiar to very, very many of you. Uh, she's a leading practitioner specialising in insolvency, commercial fraud uh, and banking. She's been recommended in the major directories as a leading junior for uh, many years. Um, the um, directories say about her uh, that she is excellent with the most complex of cases and difficult of clients. Uh, and I hope I won't be too difficult uh, in the questions <laughs> that I've got for Tina and Ollie uh, this morning. Um, numbers of, uh, of uh, attendees seem to be settling down a bit. So um, let me come to you, Ollie, first of all, uh, and ask you this. Um, how are things right now for retail real estate? Thanks, David. Uh, um... And morning, everyone. I think, you know, obviously the obvious answer, um, and you don't have to read too much of the, the press over the last 18 months or so to know that it's um, very difficult out there for retailers. And that's obviously having a knock on impact to, to landlords uh, uh, and their lenders and, and owners. Um, I think, though, the same is obviously true of a number of sectors due to the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. I think for me, what sets retail real estate apart from that and, and retail in general um, as, a, as a particularly difficult sector is um, where, as you can see, other sectors starting to bounce back uh, already. And with the further opening of the economy and international travel, et cetera, hotel, leisure, hospitality sectors starting to come back. Everyone desperate to get out there, out of their houses, spend some money uh, and be in those kind of facilities. Um, with, with retail, I think it's what it's, COVID's done is accelerated a, a long term structural change that was going on in the background anyway. I mean, if anyone can remember the pre-COVID times, uh, you know, the, the news on the high street wasn't wasn't rosy anyway. Um, so I think what what retailers have found and the knock on for, for retail real estate uh, is that it's accelerated a, a long term structural change and brought everything to a head at the same time. And we just don't see it bouncing back as quickly as, as other sectors um, clearly it bounced back to an extent, you know, when you can open up your uh, shops and shopping centers. Um, but it's, uh, it's a very challenging sector to be in uh, and uh, will continue to be, I think, for some time. I think what um, landlords need to do is really understand the asset that they've got. And it might be a, a, a theme that we keep coming back to um, over the course of this webinar. Um, but not, not all assets are equal. Um, and uh, anyone who's dealing with um, distressed real estate um, in the retail space needs to have a really clear picture of, uh, of what the asset is and what the options are uh, in particular you know whether there's any uh, ability to repurpose the asset redevelop the asset uh, away from purely um, yeah, retail fashion-led um, uh, shopping centers for example in the past um, whether you can uh, build any residential or repurpose facilities to be more uh, destination and experience uh, centres to drive a footfall, which obviously benefit the, the rest of the centre as well, all the retail space. Um, I think we'll probably touch on it a bit later as well. But again, you need to understand if you're uh, looking at a longer term hold strategy to try and um, benefit from uh, returning uh, and tightening of yields in the future, you really need to understand what that looks like, because actually, um, you know, clearly now is not, not a great time to sell any uh, retail real estate, uh, but equally, um, uh, there could be some significant capex checks to be written just to stand still for the next, you know, what could be two or three years. Uh, in our experience, in some of the situations we've been advising on, 
to, to benefit from a tightening of yields in the future. Um, just one kind of caveat to that. I think, uh, as I say, understanding each asset, there are a few small areas that have done well. So obviously the, the, the obvious one being um, kind of grocery retail, um, any shopping centers that have got anchor tenants, um, which are supermarkets or the like, um, have, have held up that that part's held up well. And again, you know, if you if you lease uh, some some real estate to uh, to any supermarkets, really, um, you know, the covenant strength there is uh, is very very good. But overall, a very challenging sector to be in uh, for those reasons, and not one that's going to bounce back too quickly from um, from from COVID. And it sounds like like the mix of tenants is is important as well. To, to maximising value from uh, from a shopping centre or or, or or retail half type uh, type situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's absolutely right, David. Um, you know, I think especially when you look at the the shopping centres and the out of town shopping centres, and we've had some experience as you know many people in restructuring will have had over the last eighteen months of advising on on those types of assets. Uh, you know, traditionally they were very kind of fashion led. Uh, uh, places where you know lots of um, lots of the, the, the capacity is taken up by uh, fashion retailers uh, or you know large department stores uh, like like Devonhams etc., cool. which have also obviously caused a significant issue. And uh, when they vacate those very large units that the likes of Devonhams uh, operate from, uh, and obviously John Lewis shutting some of their stores. Um, you know, it creates a very significant problems for the uh, for the for the centre because it, filling that space again um, is is a challenge. Um, there aren't many uh, people in the market for that kind of footprint, and um, those that are, you know, that I think I'm going to come on to talk about it a bit later. But the the, the power um, and uh, leverage in negotiations very much with the with the tenants, and you're having to look at how you use that space a bit differently uh, going forwards because you know one large. A department store isn't the way that the market's going and how do you kind of carve that up what else can you use it for um what other options have you got yeah yeah absolutely and tina and we've heard from ollie uh his experience of what's going on on the ground what about the latest legal position um are there any changes coming up that we all ought to know about well, obviously, legally, um, retail commercial landlords have actually been in a difficult position really for quite a while. So under the Coronavirus Act of 2020, um, obviously, they can't forfeit leases for non-payment um, of rent, um, although I understand they can continue to forfeit for other breaches. Um, and if you have a look at the winding up sector, um, if you wanted to go um, that route, um, and that's a route you might have used, for example, even to get a monetary payment, even if you didn't get a winding up, or if there was a winding up, um, you might have the benefit of the disclaimer provisions. Obviously, um, under the Corporate um, Insolvency and Governance Act, all creditors have been prevented from pursuing winding up petitions um, unless they satisfy the coronavirus test under um, Schedule 10. And really, in the case of many um, commercial landlords, um, where rent has not been paid um, because of the downturn in the tenant's business following the pandemic, it's really highly unlikely um, that they're going to satisfy that test. Um, now, the restrictions on forfeiture and also presenting winding up petitions were due to expire on the 30th of September of this year. Um, the provision against forfeiture has now been extended to the 25th of March um, 2022. And in the case of winding up petitions, uh, we've now got the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 um, Coronavirus Amendment of Schedule 10 regulations. Um, that's been enacted. That's due to come in force on the 29th of September. Um, and that's going to, the effect of that is that the statutory instrument will replace the current Schedule 10 with um, another, a new Schedule 10. So from October, 1st of October, really there are going to be three regimes which are going to govern winding up petitions. Um, you've got the first regime, which relates to petitions presented prior to the 1st of October, and they're continue to be governed by the existing um, Schedule 10. So the coronavirus test will need to be satisfied. Um, the second regime, um, is in the case of petitions presented from the 1st of October to the 31st of March of next year. And this 
um, apply save for what's known as excluded debts, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, there's now going to be a light touch approach um, to petitions under this new schedule. So um, essentially under the new schedule, um, a creditor won't be able to present a winding up petition unless four conditions are satisfied. Okay. So um, the first condition is that the debt has to be liquidated and have fallen due for payment. So unlike the normal position with winding up petitions where you could present a petition for a non-liquidated debt, a contingent debt or a future debt, you're not going to be permitted to do that. Um, secondly, the debt must be for a sum of £10,000 or more, um, although creditors will be able to combine in one petition to create the 10,000 or more, although each creditor will need to satisfy the other conditions. Um, thirdly, the creditor must have delivered um, a written notice to the debtor, which complies with certain um, provisions. And most importantly, the notice must actually state that the creditor is seeking proposals for payment of the debt. And if that no proposal is made to the creditor's satisfaction within the 21 days, beginning on the date on which the notice is delivered. Um, the creditor intends to present a winding up petition. And the final condition is, is that the creditor must not have received by the end of that period of 21 days, any proposal um, for payment of the debt, um, which is to the creditor's satisfaction. So that's really going to cover two positions. One, where no um, proposal is received at all. Secondly, where there is a proposal and the creditor rejects it, because it doesn't consider it to be satisfactory. Now, what's interesting about that test is that it appears to be a, um, a subjective um, test. Um, so if in fact a creditor receives a proposal and in fact um, they're not satisfied and dismisses it, then on the face of it, they will be entitled to present a petition. And perhaps you need to compare that with the um, provisions for bankruptcy if you go to Section 271, subsection 3, which requires the court to assess whether or not um, the offer has been unreasonably refused. And that obviously creates an objective element um, into the test. And that objective element is not on the face of it present in the current test. But the court might apply similar principles, which it would apply to, for example, the exercise of a discretion in an in, um, in a contractual situation, whereas if you exercise that and you make a decision, um, you mustn't do so in a way that's um, arbitrary, it's perverse, irrational, uh, or, and or capricious. So it may apply a similar test. And I can see actually the courts might do that because um, if you look at the way as to how a decision can be perverse, it's one where no um, reasonable, no rational, creditor would have rejected the proposal, which in fact would align it much more closely um, with the section um, 271, subsection three test. The final regime, and obviously um, the regime that's going to, uh, is of interest to um, retail commercial landlords, is that which governs excluded debts. And they're defined as any debt in respect of rent or any other sum of payment of which the tenant is liable to pay under a relevant business tenancy and which is unpaid by reason of a financial effect um, of coronavirus. So a relevant business tenancy is a tenancy to which part two of the Landlord and Tenant Act applies or a tenancy to which that part of the Act would apply if a relevant occupier were the tenant um, and a relevant occupier is a person other than the tenant who lawfully occupies the premises which are of form part of the premises comprised in the tenancy. So as a result of that, um, commercial landlords still have the problem that they have to satisfy a coronavirus test. Um, but unlike um, the position up until now, where um, a landlord could present a petition if he had reasonable grounds for believing that coronavirus had not had a financial effect on the government, on the company, or that the position would have been still the same, even if um, coronavirus had not had a financial effect on the company. Um, it looks as though the test from the 1st of October um, for presenting petition is more stringent for two reasons. First of all, it's no longer subject to the belief um, of, the, um, 
of the creditor, um, albeit I, I appreciate that later on when the court comes to deliver it, it's dealing with um, different things. And secondly, um, a petition cannot be presented at all if coronavirus has had a financial effect. Um, but um, regardless, um, on the second test, that um, you still could present it if in fact you still believe it would have been the same, even if it hadn't had a financial test. So um, really the test is, is that if as, um, first of all, if coronavirus has had a financial effect, and if that um, is really a reason for um, the um, debt not being paid, then you just can't present a petition at all. So in the current climate, I think it's going to be really difficult, really, for commercial landlords to um, pursue that route. It do does sound like it, doesn't it? Um, just once you catch your breath, Tina, yeah. um, we've got a question in, um, uh, which is this. Will it be sufficient to serve a statutory demand and at the same time in a covering letter give written notice to the debtor seeking proposals for payment? Does that do those mechanics work? Well, no, I think you've got to follow what the Act says. So it's not the stat demand route. It's, as I say, it's a light touch route, which actually, even under the current section, Schedule 10, what people have been doing is obviously they've in fact been doing seven day notices. So um, if, you, if you want to present a petition, it's saying, no, you've got to um, serve a notice which complies with the new Schedule 10, um, and you can only present, um, as I say, if you don't get um, a proposal or the proposal that you get is one you don't consider satisfactory. And if you present a petition, you've got to bear in mind that the debtor might seek to attack your decision um, about, you know, the way that you've reached um, that decision. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, it sounds to me as though uh, the cards are stacked against landlords. Dolly, who... Who's most at risk here? Tenants, landlords, lenders? Who's in the frame? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, just, just kind of picking up on what Tina said there. You know, it's uh, we agree in a kind of real world example that, you know, we're dealing with and we're advising on at the moment is, um, you yeah, know, we're all waiting to see what the government said post uh, 1st of October. Now they've announced it. I think there's a real feeling that the government's trying to push um not, not legislate particularly hard for this and push the problem for landlords and tenants to resolve between themselves in the most um, equitable um, way that they can. Because, um, you know, I think it, it, the legislation is relatively clear. If, if you're a COVID impacted business and that's why you haven't paid the rent, it's an excluded debt. Um, but, you know, se several of the situations that we're aware of at the moment and advising on, <clears throat> certainly they're COVID impacted businesses. And certainly that's the reason why um that they're not paying the rent um but you know by not paying the rent actually they they do have then generate some cash so um you know one of the real subjective things that i think is still left out there is could a landlord could a, a landlord run the argument that um well we understand your covid impact and that's why you're not paying the full rent but you could have made a contribution to the rent um and that it just seems like a challenge there's not enough guidance on it you know how is a landlord going to prove that that's why uh, the rent hasn't been paid in full. And then from the other side, from the tenant's perspective, um, you know, again, and we're advising in this situation, um, you look at it and say, well, how do we decide who to pay what? Um, you know, if we start paying some uh, landlords um, a, a proportion of their rent because their asset is actually more profitable for us, um, could that be a preference? <laughs> because we preferred one landlord over another even though that's what would be achieved in a cva or restructuring plan something along those lines um or do you pay everyone a proportion of their debts um or do you pay no one anything <laughs> which is certainly gives you more commercial leverage to agree the best deal you can with all the landlords going forwards so there's some real challenges for for, for tenants in there as well in terms of how they proceed um i think our view is it's, it would be very challenging for any landlord to, in essence, it's very obvious that it's a, a, a business which hasn't been particularly impacted by COVID um, to, to bring any action for a tenant not paying rent, um, certainly in the retail sphere. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious that most of them have been, have been fairly COVID impacted in one way or another. Um, just coming back to your question there, David, as to, you know, who's most at risk? Um, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's landlords and then um, beyond that, um, their, their lenders. 
Um, but there is still a bit of a spectrum. So actually, there's some still good covenant tenants out there, as we discussed. So um, any any grocery re retail, um, you know, should be fairly safe and a good covenant strength still. And even areas of um, uh, of other retail, such as um, you know Next, H and M, Halfords, obviously had a fairly good time with everyone uh, buying bikes and getting out and about and uh, uh, being. Um, DIY stores as well um, from everyone doing spending a lot of time at home and doing uh, DIY works. Um, so they are still good covenant strength quality tenants able to pay the rent in full. Um, nevertheless, there's still a longer term issue there because as and when all of their rents come up for renewal or there's break clauses, um, you know, the, the leverage that they've got and the powers certainly has shifted to the tenants to negotiate better terms. So even though they've got good quality tenants, um, landlords are still looking at um, uh, some pain when it comes to renegotiating their leases. Uh, certainly, we were aware even before COVID of Next, that wherever they're on an out-of-town retail park, uh, have tried to write into their leases that if there's ever any um, uh, compromise with uh, creditor, uh, creditors on uh, or other tenants as part of a CBA, for example, that they also get a commensurate reduction in their rent on that site because it's reflective of the market. Uh, for, for for that real estate having having moved, I'm not sure how enforceable that is or how they find out what exactly um, has happened in their in the stores. But um, you know, certainly it's an example of next knowing that they're a good covenant strength and and but wanting to use the the leverage in the market and make sure they don't miss out on uh, market adjustments uh, just because they're able to pay the rent and other tenants aren't. So it, it's certainly the um, you know, the, the, the risk uh, is passing on to the landlords. And then, you know, beyond that, when it becomes a, a problem for the lender is when the landlord itself can't, um, it can't, can't meet its um, debt, uh, debt repayments and facility um, costs. So, um, you know, we're certainly seeing that, you know, I think what we've seen so far in COVID coming back to kind of COVID and the impact is actually uh, lenders and landlords um, and tenants working together in most instances, um, really well, actually, to avoid uh, and get through the immediate consequences of COVID. So um, unless there was, you know, really significant liquidity issues, which required new money over and above, um, you know, I think where lenders could help, they have done in, in uh, obviously waiving covenant breaches for LTV covenants, things like that, um, where capital values have been impacted. And also uh, capital repayment holidays, and in some in instances as well, um, interest holidays. Um, where that hasn't been enough, we've obviously seen some action, and a clear example of that would be into where you know that that even that wasn't sufficient to uh, to prevent further liquidity challenges in that business, and therefore lenders have had to take control and have effectively become the de facto owners of those assets and. Uh, going for and have had to put new monies in to, uh, to, to, to keep them trading and maintain the values that they've got. Um, but I think there's another swathe of assets which is now starting to come to people's attention. So, you know, more recently we've been engaged in some situations where they haven't had that liquidity crunch, but owners and landlords are starting to look at it and say, uh, and this is especially true, I think, of some kind of secondary town shopping centres. Uh, you know, and secondary out of town locations where, you know, they're looking at the assets they've got and saying, well, you know, we, the, the, the lenders have been supportive thus far. Actually, maybe we have been able to pay the interest. We've been able to keep the lights on um, from the income we've had. But, um, you know, now we're at 100, 110, 120% loan to value. And, you know, we're, we're out of the money and it's going to take some big capex checks to get us back into the money. And, and we're not that interested. So actually, you know, they're, they're starting to think about uh, or they're saying, well, maybe we're not sure yet what we want to do, but we're aware that the lenders could at any stage now take a different course of action. They've been supportive up until now, but 100 or 110 percent LTV is not a long term situation where the lender can be um, in that place either. And as we said at the start, you know, that this isn't a sector where those capital values are going to bounce back very quickly. Uh, it's, a, it's a long term play, potentially requiring further capex to reposition assets redevelop assets so we're a long way from those capital values coming back and you know, some of those capital values have been very severely impacted um, you know maybe 50 percent or less of the values that they were coming into the pandemic um, so i think lots of other lenders and uh, landlords are going to have to start turning their attention to what they do here 
Um, and that's going to drive more transactions in the sector going forwards. Um, now, they may or may not require insolvency advice because where we've been involved so far, actually, you know, there's been uh, we've sold one asset where the, the, the lender and the, um, the equity effectively agreed, the landlord agreed that, you know, they, they weren't interested in putting any more money in, um, but they weren't going to stop the lender from effectively forcing through a sale. So it was a consensual sale which um, repaid the lender actually in full in that instance um, because there was some scope for residential redevelopment and it was a, um, it was a shopping centre on a high street in, a, in an area of London. So um, it had some positives. It also had a grocery tenant as well. So all those things which enabled the lender to say, do you know what? The, the value is breaking at or around our debt. So let's, you know, let's take it to market now. Uh, and it was sold and uh, actually did return a small uh, check back to equity as well. I mean, they, they suffered a horrendous shortfall, don't get me wrong, but um, they, they recovered some money. Um, so I, I can see a lot more situations like that. And we're, we're, we're in discussions with a couple of other larger landlords around some of their assets saying, you know, this is one which is underwater, which we're not interested in um, writing the checks necessary to uh, keep it in the long term. Um, and, you know, we, we need some advice in case the, the lender starts to, to get more aggressive and what, what we're going to do. But I can see more consensual transactions where, where landlords and the equity are taking that view. You know, why, why force the hand of the, the lender to enforce their security rights and uh, create more cost all round if you don't need to? But, but equally, there could be other situations where the lender and equity are taking a different view on the value um, going forwards. Um, and, you know, these assets are not going to be able to be refinanced on commercial terms for, for some time. So that, that is going to be a problem for the lenders um, as we move forward and how they then deal with it. You know, as I say, they've worked really closely, I think, in most instances to, uh, it, you know, uh, everyone on this, this call will um, be aware of the situation. But we haven't really seen a swathe of transactions at all in this space. Um, and going forward, I think we'll see that we'll see that start to start to change. And again, it goes back to knowing your asset, though, as to whether you take it to market now or pursue some kind of longer term strategy. Um, what I would caution against is you need to really understand what that long term strategy looks like. Um, we've in a situation that we've been advising on um, with a group of uh, shopping centres, like quite large shopping centres, that um, that decision to uh, that's been made to, to hold long term and, and, and try and benefit from tightening of yields and a return of capital values that's a that's a three to four year hold strategy uh, and the capex check for that is is very very significant um to, just to hold it and that's not that's not even really accretive capex that's just stand still capex and hope that yields tighten yeah. and we benefit from that because you know in that situation you could have 50 or 60 percent of your tenants even your existing tenants having break clauses in the next two or three years um, or some kind of exit uh, possibility. Uh, and again, we get back to, well, the, the, the balance of power in those negotiations is purely with the tenants. So they'll be looking for 12 to 24 months uh, rent-free period. They'll be looking for um, the, uh, the landlord to fund a refit of the, of the unit. Um, and, and again, so to attract new tenants or even replace existing tenants that you've got with the same caliber and quality, um, you've got very, very substantial capex to pursue that hold strategy. Um, and you really need to understand what that cost benefit looks like. Um, and it's still quite speculative because no one truly knows um, when yields might tighten and when there'll be appetite for, for people to come in and, and buy shopping centers again. And if you want to then try and benefit and push the value up even more from some accretive capex, um, you know, you need to start looking at uh, planning consents and development and, you know, obviously the costs associated um, with that as well. So um, it's a spectrum. It's obviously a problem for the retailers because they, they've suffered. Uh, that's had a knock-on impact on the, lend on, the, on the landlords because they haven't been able to cover their rent. Um, and in some cases, that's already proven a, a problem for the lenders where um, it's actually needed new money to keep it going. Uh, but now we're moving into a different phase, I think, where the, the LTV um, is going to be a, a real problem on retail real estate assets going forwards and drive transactions in the space one way or another. So, so it looks like a pretty bleak picture for landlords. Um, what options do they have? And one of the questions that's come in um, whilst we've been talking is whether this spells the end for statutory demands against corporate debtors. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that. 
Right, well, it really um, depends upon just answering the question. Um, it really depends on what happens after the end of March 2022, and we'll come, we'll come to that later. Um, obviously, um, it, it, when a landlord's obviously considering his options, he's got to take into account, really, as, as Ollie says quite rightly, you've got to work out your strategy and really what is going to really maximise your position. And that's something is going to be different for different retail commercial landlords. Um, but looking from a legal perspective as to the various options, well, unfortunately, there are very few options um, currently available. Um, as Ollie said, I mean, maybe the most, um, the better one at the moment is, if possible, to pursue the negotiation route um, between landlords um, and tenants. Um, obviously, um, a landlord can still sue for um, arrears of rent, can sue on any guarantee, um, seek to enforce um, a security. And that might produce some money if um, money is in fact um, available. Bear in mind that some um, tenants may um, obviously not want um, judgments to be entered against them just because of reputational um, and credit risks associated with that. Um, obviously, there's also always the option of um, putting a company into um, administration. And if looking at your strategy, um, you think, well, actually the best way forward is to see if there could be a sale of the business um, with a view of getting um, a better tenant. Or you may say, well, um, if that can't happen with um, the lease, um, maybe to try and negotiate a surrender of the lease with the administrator, or ultimately if the company's to go into liquidation, then obviously seeking to rely on the um, disclaimer um, provisions. Now, Whilst I'm saying that there may be some few options available to commercial landlords, of course, um, really commercial landlords may be faced with a position where they've really got no choice as to what options um, they could exercise, really as a result of the actions of the tenant. Um, so they might be precluded actually from taking any action of their own. Um, if tenants then seek to enter into a CDA or a Part 26A plan, or possibly um, a scheme, um, and I'm um, no doubt um, most, if not all of you, are aware of the very recent cases um, of um, in these areas of Lazarus properties and New York retailers. Um, and that obviously dealt with a challenge by commercial landlords to a CDA and um, Virgin Active Holdings Limited, um, which dealt with um, a Part 26A restructuring plan um, where some of the landlords sought, sought, sought to oppose. Um, the sanctioning of that plan. And really having a look um, at those decisions, I'm sure that they sent actually a chill down the spine of many commercial landlords. Absolutely. Yes. So really, but if, if you're having a look at the court's position on that, the court's actually really faced with a very difficult decision of having to balance the contractual rights um, of landlords against really the need to assist financially distressed retailers who have been substantially affected by the pandemic um, really, and who want to restructure their businesses um, if, in fact, they are to survive. So, um, I mean, it's inevitable, as I've really said. I mean, recovery is actually going to take time. And what these two cases really show that the um, really that the court's approach is actually increasingly favouring the recovery culture against the rights of landlords, um, with the result that many commercial landlords are, in fact, um, are effectively now banking in some sort of way the retail sector. Um, so really, I mean, if you have a look at these cases and the existing restrictions there are against commercial um, landlords, no doubt that will further involve, um, involve in some tenants really not to pay all or part of their rent um, and also to negotiate really rent cuts. I mean, that's already happening in the current climate, but I don't think these cases really assist landlords in that position. So I think I'm sure that many commercial landlords really in light of the restrictions and also these decisions um, really feel that they're currently being unjustly um, treated. Obviously big um, institutional um, landlords have actually got other people they need to account for, big pension funds and so forth. Um, now really, if you then look at against that from a pragmatic point of view, um, in reaching um, the decisions, the courts must have actually at the back of their minds what the fallout would be 
um, if, we, if they didn't actually permit um, the restructuring um, to proceed and these companies entered into a formal um, insolvency procedure, you only need to look at recent retail failures. Um, and they've seen substantial losses for both employees and also creditors. Um, and whilst landlords actually might get their properties back in these um, scenarios, um, it's unlikely they're really going to recover anything or, or they're only going to recover very little um, if a company goes into liquidation or into administration. Um, and also in the current climate as well, there must be a substantial risk that they're actually not going to find um, alternative tenants to take on their leases um, with terms which would actually be acceptable to them. I mean, just um, by way of an anecdote, if I look around my local high street, um, the Debenhams, um, we had a Debenhams, the unit that's been vacated by Debenhams has stood empty for ages. And likewise with HMV, they're not managing to relet these um, units. So I think sort of like many um, retail, re um, many retail CDAs and restructuring plans may therefore get through even though the rights of um, some commercial landlords are actually severely curtailed. Um, what these cases show that there's now some commonality of principles that um, really are applied by the courts in both um, CDAs and restructuring plans. For example, if you have a look at, they both um, look at um, both vertical and horizontal um, comparators um, when, when you're looking at plans for various reasons. Um, although it's important to stress, obviously, that there are still important differences um, between them, partly because, obviously, so far as Part 26A plans are concerned, there are additional protections um, that are imposed by the courts. But what new retail actually shows is that now reductions, and the court might approve reductions of rent, which are actually below market rent, um, and there does seem to be um, a validation of what appears to be a shift um, towards um, approving rents, which are more going towards turnover rents. Um, obviously, that's subject to the balance on the other side, that landlords are given the option to terminate their leases on the basis that if they do, the outcome would be no worse than whatever the relevant alternative would be. In Virgin Active as well, um, Snowden J also made it clear that it was really for the debtor to be free to choose whether they use a Part 26A plan or whether they pursue the CDA route. And they're really free to use whichever structure appears more likely to achieve the desired result of rescuing the company in the interests of the stakeholders um, as a whole. So companies are going to have important tactical decisions to make at the outset whether they go the CDA route or whether they go the Part 26 route. And matters which they're gonna to have to take into account, for example, are going to include, first of all, whether or not they could achieve a 75% majority overall. And obviously that's the threshold for a CDA to be approved. If that's gonna look unlikely, um, for example, but there is at least one class of creditor um, who wouldn't be an out of the money creditor who looks as though they would um, uh, approve a proposed restructuring, then a, credit, then a debtor may have no option other than to go the Part 26A route um, and then seek to invoke the cross-class cram-down provisions. So if you've got a class or classes of impaired landlords and they actually disagree with the proposed restructuring and their rights, they would have 26% or more um, of the vote, then it won't be possible to pursue the CDA route um, and the Part 26A route may be the only possible structure. Secondly, if both plans um, are actually, if both paths are actually possible, um, the, it's strangely enough, the Part 26A route may be the route that might be preferred just because the certainty that the procedure actually provides as a result of the court being involved throughout the process. Um, so there's going to be a relatively fixed timetable and certainty once the court actually sanctions um, the plan. Um, obviously, the downside of this is that you're going to have um, the costs are actually going to be front loaded and the company just may not have the cost to actually afford to go that route. By comparison with the CDA, although you may not have front loaded costs, um, it does involve some certainty, as we've seen with New York, Debenhams, 
um, if the plan is involved, because obviously subsequently a creditor might seek to um, attack the plan, so you can't get on with it. Um, and then you're subject to court timetables um, for the production of evidence and the ultimate hearing. Um, however, whichever route um, the debtor decides to go, it actually is important for the debtor, for the company, um, really to consult with landlords and other creditors at a very early stage. Um, and we see that in the case of CDAs, we've got the British Property Federation has produced best practice guidelines, which would encourage IPs to consult with the Federation at a very early stage. And that's considering very much what they're proposing um, in respect of um, landlords. And Virgin Active as well has shown that um, landlords really are encouraged um, not to sit back um, at all, to get as much information as they possibly can at a very, very early stage. And I think that's from a negotiating point of view, but also if ultimately they're going to want to um, oppose any sanction, they are going to um, need to be in that position. Thanks, Tina. Um, just before we move on, just to say, if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box um, uh, and we'll do our best to deal with them um, in the time we've got left. So um, that's a pretty gloomy picture that we've been painting um, of where things are at the moment, especially if you're a, a landlord or a lender to a landlord. Um, let's see if we can look forward, see is there any glimmer of hope on the horizon? Um, Ollie, what, what do you think the sector is going to look like in 12 months time? Yeah, I mean, look, it's uh, interesting. I completely agree, you know, with Tina as well on the commercial point she made that it's all very well understanding what the legal position is and what options there are. Um, but retail, I think, more than any other sector, uh, it's all great. But actually, everyone understands the distress and seeking to wind up a business might give you some commercial leverage in negotiations. But actually, um, you know, if you just force the, the company down the uh, insolvency route, you're just going to crystallise the position, which could end up with a vacant unit um, mm -hmm. and compounding your problems as a as a landlord, especially if you've got a, a large shopping centre and, you know, already struggling with um, uh, quite a few vacant units. Um, so, what, you know, what does the uh, the next 12 months look like? Well, um, I think we, we kind of touched on it earlier. I think the government is looking for... Um, landlords and tenants to try uh, um, as best as possible to resolve these positions between themselves I think it's come through a question on the on the panel it might be appropriate to kind of try to answer that now what is the rent arbitration scheme what could that look like um, I think it's, it's it's difficult to be very specific as to what anyone thinks that looks like at the moment I think what the government has said is that it expects um, landlords to share the burden of the financial impact of uh, coronavirus with the tenants so there, there will be some there'll be an expectation uh, in that arbitration scheme um, in the next 12 months that that landlords are helping tenants to to write off some of the arrears certainly the arrears um, you know and in retail that might also include um, reducing the ongoing rent going forwards whether that's by consensual discussion as we have said or um, a CVA or restructuring plan route because it, it, as we as we've said as well you know it's a more of a structural change in the retail space um but it's the the arbitration point is you know it's kind of interesting because um you know everyone talks about uh you know if you talk about a nightclub for example it's very clear that that nightclub was closed from the very start of the lockdown process um right through to the 19th of july and then it was open again and everyone wants to well i say everyone wants to go to a nightclub i haven't been for a number of years but if i was in my 20s i'd probably want to go to a nightclub again um, and so it's very, very clear that it could generate no income for that period. Uh, it had certain overhead costs it couldn't uh, reduce it, and the rent being you know, a very good example of that and probably hasn't been able to afford to pay any rent for that period. But once it's open again, it's trading again, it should be able to uh, pay rent again. Um, but then you've got a, a swathe of uh, businesses that are, you know, were, were kind of open or they were closed for certain periods. Uh, and then you know, retail, for example, which is then open again and um or it was closed to footfall but open for kind of click and collect and you know again businesses like Halford's actually doing pretty well during the, even the closure periods um so uh, it's not going to be a kind of one size fits all in the arbitration i don't see really how you can do it without having an almost like a 
uh, you may say I would say this because it drives more work our way, but almost like an IBR on the business to say, well, okay, well, how much cash did you generate in this period? What were your costs? Um, yeah, you know, what, what rent could you have afforded to pay to be, you know, break even, um, which seems to be the only kind of fair and equitable way of, uh, of dealing with that, that arbitration. Um, there's no there's no guidelines yet but that seems like a hugely onerous exercise to do that in every landlord and tenant relationship uh that suffered some kind of um you know rent arrears uh over the last 18 months um, and then you've got an added complexity maybe not as much in the retail space because they're they're opening and trading again with with no real restrictions um but you know as we use that nightclub as the example um you've got uh, other businesses where even though they're they're freely open to trade at the moment the impact of um, of COVID-19 is going to be with them for some time. An obvious one is obviously care homes where you know, their occupancy was uh, severely impacted over the last uh, or certainly in the early stages of coronavirus. And it's going to take a long time to build that occupancy back up again. Um, you know, another serviced offices is another good example of that, where all of their customers are on short term tenancies. They were told not to go to the office. So they have not renewed those tenancies and occupancies significantly down. And it's probably starting to rebuild now. But um, it's going to take you know, 18 months, two years, maybe even, even longer to get back to mature occupancy levels. So they're going to have the financial effects of coronavirus uh, ongoing, despite the, the government restrictions being lifted. So um, it's really difficult to see how the government's going to come up with some kind of arbitration scheme, which fits all of the different impacts of COVID across the different sectors and the different businesses. And as I say, the only real reason, the only real way I can see of, of doing it equitably is understanding what the cash flows were uh, for each of those businesses and what rent they could have uh, afforded to pay uh, during the period. Um, but again, there's a huge cost associated with calculating uh, that on a kind of an independent basis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we touched again, you know, what's what we're going to see over the next 12 months. I think we're going to see uh, people who have worked together for this point now starting to say, okay, well, fine we've got through coronavirus we're back up and trading again um, but we've taken on a lot of leverage we've got all these arrears how do we face up to that and how do we uh, tackle this new phase because we're not in a in a long-term sustainable position even though everyone's been supportive now and I think we're going to see those stakeholders start to be, be a bit more attrition between the lenders the landlords and the tenants as to how they move forward uh, in retail specifically I think that there aren't a lot of options for landlords because that a really aggressive uh, option of just um, you know, seeking a winding up uh, to position for the winding up statute demand or notice uh, and then a winding up doesn't really get them anywhere. It's a bit of a hollow threat because you end up with a vacant unit you can't let. Um, so I think it leads us down the, the consensual discussion route, which is clearly where the government are trying to push people um, you know, by kind of having this threat of arbitration in the hope, I think, that most people resolve it in the next uh, few months before they actually have to uh, utilise any arbitration scheme. Uh, between different parties um, and then again between landlords and and their um, and their lenders I think yeah as we discussed earlier you know the, there's going to need to be some grown-up conversations between them about how they go forward because lots of these assets are not um, not they can't be refinanced at the current levels of debt um, and it'll be uh, up, up to equity whether they want to resolve that or effectively throw the keys to the to the landlord uh, to the lender sorry one way or another Thanks, Ollie. Um, and Tina, um, from your perspective, from the lawyer's perspective, what's going to be fashionable over the next 12 months? What are we going to see in court? Well, I think as a result, um, it won't necessarily be in court, but I think as a result, if you look, I think CDAs have really been given a new lease of life in this, uh, in this sort of sector. Um, so I think this form of restructuring um, will increase. What's actually been shown by this case um, and in fact, also the previous case, Debenhams, is that really um, a CDA is a flexible vehicle. It's not just suitable for the small to medium sized companies with relatively simple plans. Um, it can be used to be adapted by larger retailers with much more complex plans, the sort of plans you, know, you, you would see um, in restructuring, part 20A restructuring plans. Um, also, so far as Part 26A plans um, are concerned, um, really at the moment, the uptake on these plans um, does appear to have been confined um, to the larger companies. Yeah. Um, and that may just be because of the upfront costs um, really involved in this. 
but I still think that, I mean, um, assuming, I mean, cost permitting, um, there's no reason why this route also shouldn't be followed by SMEs. Um, although, as I say, they've yet to make their mark on this form of restructuring. Um, but maybe that's something that might change um, within the next 12 months. Um, whether or not other legal approaches will be used really by commercial landlords, of course, is going to depend upon the relevant um, legislation. Um, if both the forfeiture and winding up legislation is extended beyond March um, 2022, then legally not a lot's going to change. Um, so, um, and whether or not the government will extend, I think to a certain extent will depend on really what coronavirus does in the next six months and to what extent the, cover, the government thinks, well, we've given a sufficient opportunity for reading tailors at least to get some um, sort of recovery. Um, if the league, as I say, if they're not continued, um, then, well, in, in, in so far as actually the next six months is concerned, so far as um, um, sort of non-commercial landlords are concerned, so just normal creditors, I think we actually will see um, an increase um, in winding up petitions. So, um, and probably an increase in winding up orders being made. So landlords may have no choice in this, um, but they just might be left with um, empty yeah. units. Um, and that particularly must be the case where you've just got companies, which I would call zombie companies, which have really taken advantage of all of these restrictions. They've taken advantage of furlough, but really their underlying businesses are not strong businesses, and that's really not going to change. Um, then I think those companies probably will go under. And even if the restrictions are not extended, I mean, even landlords, we don't know what, how the climate will be going forward in the next 12 months, but for those sorts of companies, even landlords might say, well, it's just not worth really supporting these form of tenants. Um, you know, um, if things are picking up a bit, it might be better actually to forfeit these leases um, yeah. and see and, and get other tenants in these units so um yes so it's a bit like a crystal ball once um i think the six months <laughs> has passed just uh, just, just pick up on pick on yeah. one on one thing there on the cva yeah. I, don't, I don't 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 disagree at all uh, certainly on the the kind of use of cvas just one thing and it's maybe slightly more anecdotal but in you know one mm -hmm. of the uh, situations that we're um advising on at the moment um, you know landlords feel pretty bruised by cvas and restructuring plans and you know clearly the the outcome of recent cases has, has embedded that you know that these tools can be used to mm -hmm. as long as you're always offered the option of having your vacant property back these these are legitimate tools to uh, crown down and compromise in any real way that the company sees fit to um the the rent um so um what we've had one situation with you know 25 external landlords where we've actually entered into bilateral consensual discussions with all 25 mm -hmm. and i think that has gone down really well with landlords you know and the, the the premise of that was you know we've got a serious significant problem here you're all aware why because of coronavirus um and we, we're looking to to find a solution that works you know for us and for you as the landlord going forward without having to you know uh, embark down the big stick route of uh, a CVA restructuring plan or, or indeed a, an administration, which indeed could be an option in this case or could have been an option at the start of this case. And can actually, I, sorry, go on, Tina. Can I, oh, yeah. Can I just ask you, Ollie, on that? So you're, if, you, if you're doing individual consensual agreements, do the landlords, though, actually say, well, what are you agreeing with all the other landlords? Um, or, or are they content really <laughs> to negotiate yeah. on that individual basis? I mean, it's it's interesting. I think in that case, and that's where, yeah, that's where I was kind of coming mm. to. We've actually done some really good deals, which were probably far better than we could have done through a CBA um, or restructuring plan. Because mm. obviously the beauty of it is no other landlord knows what other landlords are getting. <laughs> and if you had to... And we've been able to do tailor each one so that yeah. you know that works for the for the business going forwards um you know whereas obviously cva wouldn't really be possible in that case to have 25 different categories of yeah. um uh, of of landlords and each one having a different and if they see what other landlords are getting they're saying oh hang on a second that deals off the table i've seen what they're getting now yeah. so i think it's really helped but landlords also feel that they've got something out of it because it's not it's not been enforced upon them in a way a cva or restructuring yeah. plan would um, they've been able to negotiate and uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be um, 
a, a little careful about what you talk about in terms of the other deals that you've been doing. But I think it's a case of showing the the landlord the economics of their particular unit or their particular yeah. site. You know, I think um, they kind of get that. That's effectively what a CVA would do anyway. Here's what you know. Here's what revenue we generate from your site. Um, here's what the projections look like for your site. Um, what's an equitable way of, uh, of splitting this between rent and a return for us going forwards? Uh, and obviously that's been a real combination of different things, you know, some, and there's also been kind of contributions to the rent, uh, to the rent arrears as well, offered to different various degrees to different landlords uh, as part of a, a deal. But it's also enabled them to, to offer certain incentives to the landlord. You know, for example, well, okay, if you agree to this, we'll also extend the lease by, you know, five or 10 years. So you've got surety of tenure for uh, a longer period of time that's going to help your capital values going forwards as well. Um, so, yeah, we've had a lot of success in that instance with negotiating. We're down to, I think, the last two or three now out of 25. So it looks like at the start, I think, you know, we hoped for a fully consensual outcome, but felt that it might be a challenge. Whereas I think now we're, you know, actually looking like we could get to the finish line and fully and consensually restructuring all of those 25 leases. Mm. This is a fascinating area, uh, and this is part one um, of uh, a two-parter we hope to do on retail restructuring, to be joined uh, in due course by one of Ollie's partners, Sen Aligar, um, who can speak from his experience of retail restructuring. So watch this space for our announcement of when that webinar uh, is going to take place. In the meantime, Ollie, can I thank you very much, and Tina, can I thank you very much for your insight uh, uh, and your experience in, in this fascinating area. Uh, can I thank all our attendees for their time this morning? Uh, it's been great to have you here. Uh, and we hope to see you again at the next Radcliffe Chambers webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.